we can't be here without having this conversation. So uh, it's my privilege to have on stage and having this conversation, Professor P. J. Narayanan, Triple IT Hyderabad, Professor Sunil Bhagwat, who I think will be joining us in a few minutes. Karishma Kaushik from India Bioscience, and moderating all of them in conversation, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, former Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Can I have a round of applause for everyone? Thank you. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this panel on innovation and the uh, university system. Um, we are in the university system, and we have the director of ISER Pune, Dr. Sunil Bhagwat here. We have a director of another institute, Dr. Narayanan from the IIIT Hyderabad. And we have uh, Dr. Karishma Kaushik, who heads India Bioscience, which is an umbrella organization which uh, spreads both understanding and facilitation, as well as points towards innovation in the life sciences ecosystem. Um, now, the simple question before us, and I'll put that to each of our panelists, is we have a set of challenges which face us as a country, as institutions, in our local environment, and so on. And we know what the potential solutions to those are through our fundamental research and applied research and potential applications. And do you let the structures, the structures which we have, our university system, organically attend to those problems, or can we put in facilitating mechanisms which can spur innovation and scale up that innovation exponentially? So that's the question. What, what, what do we need to do if we want to scale up innovation exponentially in the different kinds of contexts of our university system? You have ISARs, you have Ferguson College next door, you have a medical college somewhere else, you have Pune University here. Uh, in each of these contexts, is spurring innovation meaningful? First to you, Karishma. Karishma has been at Pune University as a Ramalinga Swami fellow for the past few years. She's a MD, PhD, and has worked in America. So she has an experience both abroad and in India, in the university system. And then today she's herding all the life sciences cats. Yeah. Karishma. Thank you, Vijay, and thank you to the organizers of India Science Festival. And thank you for describing my many hats. I now have to decide which hat I'm wearing when I'm answering this question. Administrator, researcher. But I'll tell you this, if it come, or when it comes to whether we should let the system organically grow, uh, grow into solving problems that are locally relevant, um, I, or you know, a top-down approach, I can tell you from having been a researcher that office memorandums are usually met with a lot of fear. They are usually read uh, with a lot of uh, concern. So I would opt for the, uh, for the approach where we encourage people to think of local problems and solve them and maybe incentivize them, saying if you're solving a local problem like gar garbage disposal or uh, river pollution, then you know, this is some extra funds you can get through a grant or some extra incentives rather than imposing it because then you'll have people doing research because they need to fit that criteria, they need to fit that mandate and that's uh, going to only lead to chaos at ground level in my opinion. Um, let's see what you have to say. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to you Karishma, I'll just go around once and uh, Professor Bhagavat, you've been in a laboratory, one of the top laboratories which is also part of the university system uh, in Mumbai, the Institute for Chemical Technology where extraordinary interactions with industry have taken place and extraordinary contributions to industry have taken place from the core laboratory work. And now you are at a university system where it's a very different approach, a different way of doing things, where individuals teach and do their own thing, at the same time the university has a, a outcome which is coordinated. How do you contrast these two in terms of what I just asked, in terms of building innovative frameworks? Uh, thank you. Uh, even before I go there, what I would say that uh, there are a few things we need to keep in mind that uh, culturally, culturally set us apart from many other parts of the world. And one of them is uh, resistance to or averseness to risk-taking. Our societies tend to make people think that play secure first rather than take a risk. 
And in the same lines, coming to the part which you asked, uh, ICT may be a rare exception. But if you look at, by and large, what 90% plus of our students are going through learning today, these are teachers who may have studied a subject 20 years ago and are perhaps teaching the same things. Syllabi don't get revised as frequently. The teachers themselves are not connected to use of that, that knowledge with the industry. Teachers are not connected with the cutting edge developments of the subject and that is not an individual's blame. The system is set up in such a way that most of our teachers in the college system and also in the university system are left with no time for learning themselves. Many teachers today forget that they are first students and they have to remain students right till the end. Only then they can be good teachers and only then can the next generation try and look at them and emulate them. Today, fortunately, I can say that in ISA, when faculty members are all engaged in research, they get their own accolades for that and our students see it and very similarly in ICT as well. When they see their teachers, most of the times they end up becoming their role models. And if the teachers are themselves engaged in research, connected with industry, doing something active, I'm sure the students will also get encouraged. And uh, to look at whether it should be from the top or from the bottom, I think the interest already exists in the bottom. Enabling that needs to happen from the top. Thank you. That's very nicely put. Karishma pointed out the importance of bottom-up efforts. And Bhagavad has pointed out how um, you know, there is the need to have teachers whom one can emulate and some top places do that and that needs to uh, spread a bit more. No, no, no. Oh, so, thank you again for uh, this opportunity. Um, uh, so, I come in the other end, what he said, ICT end, where uh, uh, you know, things change so fast that you know, we have to, even in classroom, we teach things which were just came out in papers two years, three years ago. Because students will challenge us for that. But yeah, but otherwise, Triple IT Hyderabad, we have a, institutionally, we are a, yeah, we are an institution that fully, uh, financially and otherwise self-sufficient. We are started by the, or facilitated by the state government, but no funds, no, you know, we have salaries, bills, everything we pay for ourselves. But we have adopted a very research-oriented uh, approach from the start. So we have a you know different model from the universities and other than we are, and that's that we have the great responsibility of raising resources, but have the probably the most autonomy among most kind of institutions in the in the country. Yeah, I think the, the idea that uh, uh, innovations should come from the uh, universities is, is is a given, and I would say the universities should start innovating on their own models. I mean that's a very important thing. How do you how do you incentivize faculty or how do you make sure solutions are, are emerge from the from the, you know, the labs uh, so most of us are comfortable with what is called academic research which probably sit in uh, in, in, a, in the papers and cupboards and at least at triple uh, we started a few years ago to have explicit push for what we call applied research or translational research which is slightly different in AI because in AI with data and things you know, every research is applied or there is nothing, the very little pure theoretical research. So if you don't show it on the latest data set or the best data set, it's not uh, not accepted anymore. So which means you are very much connected with actual problem data sets, results on on something that works. It may not be a social problem, it may be a artificial data set, etc. But we have been engaged now in the last uh, four or five years with many uh, local problems in AI for healthcare, AI for transportation, etc. areas where this is this is very difficult because in our, uh, you know, we are coming engineering, mostly computer science, doubly, doubly background. And, and we definitely need domain experts, both, uh, you know, sciences as well as, you know, healthcare and uh, Government, I mean, nothing can be done in the healthcare, or especially public health area, without active uh, cooperation from government, from NGOs, from the people of the ground. So that's a very slow process, but I think we have been uh, we have put the idea into the system, into the faculty that some of it should be done. I mean, again, it's not as if 100% do that, but 
maybe 20 percent, 25 percent of the people engage strongly with applied and translational kind of research is the goal, and uh, we are increasing that. We have made it clear to the faculty that we should going forward we should be doing that because impact on the society and today with AI and computers uh, the impact on the real problems is very easy and very immediate in at least some of them not not all of them some of them very immediate so we should be seen there but that's where the world will be more valuable we have you know on this panel um, Narayanan who comes from a engineering anchored institution and Bhagwat and Karishma from more science anchored context and engineering institutions typically when their undergraduates finish, have placement opportunities, but there's also a tendency during their undergraduate period for them to look upon innovation and entrepreneurship as natural routes in their career pathway. Whereas for science students, that's typically not the case. So my question to Karishma first and then to Bhagwat is the following. Is there a value in having two kinds of structures in our science-anchored institutions? One, an active placement structure where industry comes in in a manner similar to engineering institutions for industry jobs and to help facilitate that, have the fourth year of your four-year undergraduate course or the fifth year of a master's course which is focused on innovation as part of your research projects either in industry or in an innovation center around your institute rather than only in laboratories uh, so that these students now see industry and entrepreneurship as a legitimate career rather than only going step in their graduate studies. Karishma. This is a much debated and also it has been tried. This has been tried. I know that in several uh, government universities like state and central universities, they do internships in the fourth and fifth year. Now, how does this differ from computer science or information technology? One thing is if we train them for jobs in biosciences, in life sciences, biotech, there aren't an, as many jobs after a basic degree as it is with a basic degree like a BE you know, or a bachelor's in computer science. We have far more tech uh, companies in India than biotech companies that are recruiting in India. Secondly, once they do join these companies, often their growth is tied to having a PhD, which in computer science you need not have. Right? Most of our uh, CEOs or CTOs of Microsoft and Google are not PhDs, if you think about it. On the other hand, many of them would just have dropped out of college. But that's a different story, you know, let's not take it down that path. But if you have to grow in the company, you need a PhD. So then often once they enter industry, the question is, should we come back to academia? How easy is it to give the entrance exams and come back? It's also very difficult to expect a student in the fifth year of their integrated masters to commit to industry or academia. A via media would be to give them some exposure and you know, they figure it out. But I don't think they are ripe to put them to industry as soon as they finish their basic degree. More about um, working for a year in an innovation park instead of an internship during a master's or having an innovation park around where they could take up projects in collaboration with entrepreneurs. But yes. uh, Bhagwat. See, here I would say I am in a unique position to have experienced an engineering institute as well as today looking at a science institute. Working for an industry comes naturally to engineering graduates. Even to some extent, having startups will come naturally to engineering graduates. However, science students have a thought process that they have to do this, 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 which they would look at emulating what they see as role models. And for them, the role models happen to be their science teachers who have succeeded as a scientist. In spite of that, let me say an institute like ICER has an Atal uh, incubation center. We are introducing a special course in entrepreneurship for students. So it's not just working for the industry, but they can be even industry creators. That feeling we are trying to inculcate in amongst our students. But as of today, I see majority of the students think 
that their primary goal should be doing a PhD and looking for an academic job. And if they can't get that, as a plan B, they would look for an industry job, which is exactly the opposite, or at least definitely not this way, when you talk about engineering students. We will take some of those students. <laughs> So, go ahead, uh, Narayan. Well, yeah. So, from Triple IIT's perspective, you have been around for about 15, 25, 25 years 25, now? Yeah. And so, how many students, are students increasingly going into their own companies now, um, involved in innovation in other companies, and are faculty members also involved now? So, students, uh, is, you know, the one problem with uh, ICT, Engineering is one, ICT institutions is that placements is a problem because they get fantastic jobs and people come, choose institution based on what average pack, package of the graduating student, which is the wrong way of you know getting students at least, right? So uh, people, there was a wave of you know second year, third year students trying, they want to start up, they start up something, etc. But at that point, when they come to graduation, they they would rather be in a Google or a Microsoft, far more comfortable job. But in the before that, they were willing to experience. I mean, that that will be large number or good number, not large number. But I think today there are a, a, a non-small number of uh, graduates who wants to try out something they do. You know, they do a masters or they with the whatever product they build, they want to take it out as uh, as uh, uh, a. a, a product there, you know, a company and we have maybe three, four PhD students who have converted their thesis, you know, like somebody is doing a, working on capturing humans from multiple cameras and capturing the clothing, etc. Now they're creating a, a, a try-on app, you know, a startup that will create technology, I mean, it's a direct uh, extension of the PhD. So these are the kind of companies we really want, not just, you know, yet another uh, food app or something like that, right? So there is a small number, not a large number, but I think we, we should expect only, you know, if you get one or two per year, that would be wonderful news. And I would like to add that we need engineers also looking at research. And let me clarify one thing for at least some of the audience. When you said ICT, you mean Information and Communication Technology. And I was referring to Institute of Chemical Technology. So, <laughs> some confusion on that. But we need to have engineers who are going to engage in research and we need to have science graduates who are looking at becoming entrepreneurs. You can't have strict barriers that this degree means you only do this. And it's only the cross-fertilization which will lead to better prospects for people. Thank you very much. Well, now we'll take some questions from... Karishma, you want to add something? Uh, yeah. So we'll take questions from the audience. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we showed a lack of innovation in the title of this panel, and that's why we don't have huge cro crowds. We should have called it Artificial Intelligence and Innovation, and then we would have had 500 people. Um, but nevertheless, I think we have a committed audience. So questions, and the gentleman in the t-shirt, red and white t-shirt first, and then this other person. Uh, yeah, so very good afternoon. Uh, I'm studying in B.Y. Patel University for bachelor's degree. Uh, I just had a question that uh, me and my team have thought about a startup and uh, we are just on the idle stage that it's just a raw idea but we are really we are really uh, fetching a problem to like how to search for mentors who will properly guide us to uh, properly reach our goals and reach the perfect or the uh, targeted audience so that we can grow in our uh, startup and we can uh, prosper this idea to means leading to India's development and all. I just had a doubt about that. Yeah, fortunately, I have a good answer to that, even though it's a very difficult question. So there is something called the Pune Knowledge Cluster, which was started a few years ago, which has all the major institutions in Pune as participants and is actually anchored, I think, at Ayuka, which is close by here, and ISER is a participant and other universities are there. And they have for mentoring um, people such as you. So contact them specifically. But in general, your question is a very important one, because at this stage, uh, what you need are a good set of mentors. And in the US, for example, in the West Coast, the, there was an organization about 30 years ago called TIE the Indus Entrepreneurs, 
and they had successful entrepreneurs getting together and their principal job was to mentor others to come up. And that kind of an organization is more are needed and the Pune Knowledge Cluster is one such organization which brings successful people together to help people like you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, this is a question to Narayan, sir. Uh, I have my own company in AI, and I have seen that, uh, especially triple IT, triple IT is uh, very innovative in a lot of, if you talk about the AI modeling and you know, having uh, uh, AI infrastructure, actually. So why triple uh, IT only is able to make that kind of impact? Should I go? Why triple uh, IT are able to make so much impact in innovation and especially in uh, artificial intelligence? Where other uh, institute like uh, you talk about here or uh, in Madhya Pradesh, we are not able to make it. Actually, I am a consultant to some of the university also. What is a, uh, that magic thing about triple IT when they are able to do so much innovation? Um, I am in IT industry for the last 30 years and you know, I have seen So, Narayan, he is accusing you of unbridled success compared to others. Yeah, I, 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 I wish it's all of us is true, but I, I will take the compliment, but I, I'm not sure if we have done that much more success than other institutions. But one thing, you know, I have got to say, if, uh, one thing is that, you know, when we started, we put undergraduate research as a primary, uh, one of the unique aspects of the institution. All undergraduates working in the institute has the option of joining a, a research group or a faculty at the end of two years and working the next two years with a problem with a faculty member. And they earn a special degree called B.Tech Honours. And it's optional, you can drop out whenever you want if you, do, if you don't like it, etc. But this, uh, on the ground, somehow we are also able to hype this uh, a little bit, which is by chance. And uh, roughly, uh, more than half of the undergraduate to choose this option, which means they get much greater than average undergraduate exposure into whatever they choose. I mean, a lot of AI activities are there, which is just because we do our academic research, these students are able to take part in that. I mean, with AI, I mean computer vision, we have a strong computer vision group, very strong language processing group, robotics group, etc. So, this, so the students work in any one of them, which means I think they are able to, when they leave, they are able to leave with a understanding of, some understanding of what research is, what problem solving is, rather than just basics. So that, I mean, that, that's one thing that industry also appreciated that your people know how to solve problem, find solutions themselves. So that they have, they have some practice in it, most of them have some practice in it. So that's what, that's what, only thing I would think we are doing significantly different. Yes. I fully support that model that undergraduate students, right after their first year, should be engaged in the research activity. And ICERs also follow the same model for science students, right from their second year onwards, and a full one-year research project in the fifth year. That makes them more look at things which are continually changing, because only ch thing constant in science would be change. There will be nothing which uh, you are using 50 years, and it still continues to be exactly in the same way. And of course. Uh, in ICT, the information and communication technology has this rate of change much higher than any other. And they are focused exactly into that. Well, uh, these have been successful examples. If I draw parallels to university systems, these are at much smaller scale than our public university systems in India, which is a larger conversation as to whether Indian education has to transform towards being mass education or boutique education and if we choose specialized, small, well thought out programs and how are we going to cater to hundreds of millions in the age group of 18 to 25, which is a larger conversation for NEP to have. So in that context, you know, let me add one point particularly because we are in ISER Pune. I mean, one of the questions I keep hearing from students and faculty members is, why are we constantly being asked to do something applied? Um, and they mistake that, they wrongly state that in a manner to say that, why aren't we allowed to do fundamental research? So I think that's the conflation which is there. The point is, we will always be asked to do something useful. It's not that we're 
prevented from doing useless things. Useless science is very valuable and through useless science great things can happen. So the question is what can be done in a place like ISER? And I would urge you to look at uh, a portal which the Principal Scientific Advisors Office has recently set up. It's called Manthan and it's got 600 crores worth of proposals which industry has put out for problems to be solved. And these, many of these problems can be solved by people in basic science, in applied research and computational approaches, and you can get paid for it as individuals, as institutions, or as groups of institutions. So your fundamental research then becomes both of value to the community, but also some way by which you can earn resources for the institution. So that was sort of a commercial advertisement in between, but um, any questions, comments? Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for such an engaging discussion. Like uh, Bhagwat sir said, uh, I'm happy to say that I'm uh, one of them as an engineer who is also interested in pursuing research. But for those of us who are unfortunately not uh, in touch with or not a part of an institution that professors actively are engaged in research in, as a student, what would be all of your suggestions for those who are interested in research but not in contact with professors to foster that. And as an institute, how do you foster these students who are want to actively and are willing to research? How do you make changes as a student and as an institute as well? You want, you want to get in touch with professors in other institutions? Uh, yes, uh, for the students to get in touch with other institute professors, professors. and for the, professor, uh, the institutes to actively foster this as well. Right. So, yeah, one thing I would say that our institute has several applicants coming for a semester project and year project to work with us. That is number one. So that door is always open. Second thing is your graduation degree is not the end point, right? Like typically they say up till 10th standard you were told you do your studies and after that life is going to be easy. It was not that way, right? So same way after your graduation is not the end point. You do your post-graduation, do your higher study degrees somewhere where you want to do. And while doing your undergraduate as well, you can always approach other institutions. Yeah, same thing, I think we all, I mean, all institutions, we plenty of other problems are probably gets a few hundred interns per year. I mean, these are, we don't have a centralized program of taking time. We do have one, you know, with uh, the last few years, we've been running a program called Srishti, which is, uh, as a long uh, online internship, a long online course like uh, module and over 100 of them are brought for internships uh, in summer. But most institutions, the professors want to see motivated people. When we all get emails, hundreds of emails looking for CISO, you have to do something. I mean, there are opportunities to, to, to show and do something yourself exists. And you have to catch the attention. Otherwise, you know, there are so many emails come. Yeah. No, um, can one practical tip at the cost of some propaganda for India Bioscience. Are you a Bioscience graduate? No. Pardon? Computer Science. Computer Science. Okay, then our monthly newsletter probably won't work for you. But look if there are other organizations with newsletter opportunities that tell you about internships. Uh, and then you can contact professors and take it from there. Let me add to that by giving you an example. That we do receive a barrage of emails, and because of that, many of them go unresponded. But don't hesitate to find innovative ways for getting in touch with people who you genuinely think will be useful to you. Um, one example, many, many years ago, Steve Jobs wrote to Packard of Hewlett Packard fame, looked up the telephone directory, found his number, made a cold phone call and Packard answered that call and he said, I need this kind of a microprocessor which your company makes, can you give it to me because I want to do something. And, and he got an answer to that and, and you know, started his work. Now, normally you would say that's a ridiculous call to make. That's likely to be unsuccessful, Packard will not answer. If he answers, he's going to put the phone down. If he doesn't, he's not going to send you the processor. But these kinds of things are typically actually not the case. People are very willing to help and talk to people. So don't hesitate to accost them in a polite and friendly manner. Hello, sir. Uh, this is Yogesh. I am a BTEC graduate turned into science uh, educator, actually. 
I think a school should be the fulcrum of innovation instead of uh, universities. Uh, actually, sir, uh, what happens is many of the educators and teachers are from the non-tech background, and even the education officers are also from the non-tech background. There is a huge back gap in the education about the science awareness, and uh, you know, uh, like in this decade, technology will be way more faster and we will not be able to cope up with the space of that technology. So uh, how is the government is going to bridge that gap? Like I am striving at my individual level and even how uh, the government is going to support the guys like us. I fully agree with you that a lot more can be done at the school level, number one. Two, the student's ability to think laterally or out of the box is higher at the school level than later, right? I'm glad to see that as a tech person you are engaged into school education. However, if you look at our 10th standard student coming out, world over it is considered that Indian 10th standard boy or girl knows a lot more than most other countries. But throw a problem which is unseen before, something to be done out of the box thinking and the story is very different. So what you said is very right and at school stage innovation can be built. Of course can't be of the same type that university level can do. But the thinking process should be set in the school. I agree fully. Uh, there's one more question there. Uh, go ahead. Um, how much time do we have by the way? Five minutes more. Okay. Uh, and uh, the couple. Why did you let him ask since you've already asked a question? Go ahead, Aditya. I have a, a question from a very different uh, area. So, uh, if you look at OpenAI, there was about a billion dollars that went into that company. If you compare, uh, if you take all the money that went in from the same first algorithms even before the company. This was before Microsoft came in, That's a, and they put in about 10 billion. In the pharma world, it's similar. Somewhere between 800 million to a billion dollars is until a product becomes. Good. So let's take the technology from the very outset, from the university. You get in about that if you take a, a drug, for example, which makes, uh, which requires a billion dollars to come into the market, how much was required when it was at the university? It turns out about 40 million. So when we look at the universities, the incubators, the technology, the mentorship networks and all of that which people come into with their research, how far does that mentorship go? How far does it think about it? So for example, if you look at some of our facilities, uh, some of our funding agencies in this country, how many of them who are willing to give five crores or one and a half crores for starting something are thinking for that person for the entrepreneur, who could be a scientist also. Where is his next 10 million going to come, of, uh, come from? Which VC networks? Is it going to be VCs? Is it going to be companies? If it's going to be a company, are they going to drive the research into a certain direction? That thinking, can we see that in all of these networks? Yeah, so I'll perhaps answer that question. Let the helicopter go by. I also see crowds pouring and I think the next session has got an interesting title. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, I think there is, uh, I mean there's no question that you need resources and you need resources on scale, you need it early stage, mid stage, late stage. But the question, we need to move beyond stating the problem to understanding it and seeing what solutions are possible now while resources come in. Now we must keep in mind that if we Imagine that we can't do anything until we proportionately scale our investment similar to uh, the size of our population as the US has done, for example. If we do a simple calculation, the kinds of monies which are required for that are not going to be attainable in another 50 years. And therefore, that model of scaling innovation and enterprise will not work. Another model, I'm just putting it to you as a possibility, is we must remember that we stand on the shoulders of global innovation over centuries. Publicly available knowledge and their understanding and standing on that going to the next step 
means that you're leveraging investments already made all over the world and using that. Now that aspect, India can use well. And India's two strengths are, I should say three. One is understanding science and technology at its deepest, no matter what the subject, that we must expand that capability. Second, using that understanding for frugal innovation, to remove bells and whistles and to, uh, and, and to frugally innovate. And thirdly, to scale. So if we push hard on understanding with experimentally and in terms of computational and other approaches, and having frugal solutions and scaling that, we can do wonders. Finally, for all these three, if you look at markets, both national and international, we can do well. International markets are much more rewarding, much less uh, you know, uncertainty in terms of regulation, but at the same time, challenges in doing that. So it's a complicated route. Some industries in some sectors are doing well or reasonably. Others need to uh, be supported more. So I think we should look at what's feasible. I think we have run out of time. Uh, but I'd like to thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, and it's, it's been very useful, at least for the panel, to clear up our thoughts, as I hope it's for you. Thank you very much. And I thank all my panelists. Thank you. Thank you.